Okay, good morning, everyone. So thank you, first and foremost, for being here, for taking your time out from undoubtedly your busy schedules. My name is Boris Lushniak. I go by Boris, so that's easy to remember. The Lushniak I even have problems with. Um, <laughs> And I'm currently the Dean uh, and Professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland, Go Terps, Fear the Turtle, all that. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be uh, the chair of our working group. Uh, and we'll acknowledge working group members shortly. Uh, but uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you, the participants, for being here. I think we have around 170 people who are registered for this. So my hope is as the day goes on, the morning time progresses, that we do get more people in the audience. This is a full two-day meeting, and I really do appeal to all of you to be participants in this meeting. You'll hear about how we're taking a risk approach here, because if you've come here to listen to PowerPoint slides, if you've come here to just be told what's going on, then I would probably walk out now, honestly. If you've come here, uh, Greg Burrell is on his way out. Yeah, thank you, Greg. <laughs> But if you come here to be part of a conversation that I think is critical, then stay here and be part of it. Because what we're talking about is very, very important. So welcome. This is building a national capability to monitor and assess medical countermeasure use in response to public health emergencies, a workshop hosted by the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and supported by the Food and Drug Administration. So I thank the attendees, the speakers, the planning committee. Planning committee, please all stand or wave or something. Thank you so much for the planning committee. As well as the staff, and in particular, Project Director Justin Snare, Board Director Andy Pope, who I believe is out there somewhere, staff, and our facilitator, Laura Runnels who you're going to get to know very well over the course of the few days. I'm going to go through now sort of the formalities, which is just to remind you of what are our objectives here today. So statement of the workshop objectives. Number one, we're discussing the roles and efforts of the federal government and relevant stakeholders who have an interest in building and maintaining a national medical countermeasures, MCM, monitoring and assessment capability for public health emergencies. The key point here is multiple stakeholders. Reality is it takes a village, to use that term, to be able to do what we want to be doing. And in particular, we're not talking about, you know, sort of the work of the SNS of getting stuff out. We're talking about this ability for us to monitor and assess the stuff we send out, and determine how we can do that in the midst of a public health emergency. So that's point number one. Point number two, we're discussing federal monitoring and assessment. Notice that word keeps coming up, monitoring and assessment. So plug that in. So if we're talking distribution, if we're talking stockpile stuff, back away from that. It's monitoring and assessment. So we're discussing federal monitoring and assessment efforts and opportunities for future work in areas including, and here's kind of the, the list that we have come up with, but this list can be expanded depending on your perspective. So what we're trying to emphasize is when we're talking about monitoring assessment, electronic health record capabilities. Kind of a newfangled approach, if you will, a growing approach, yes, a controversial approach, and thus far a not well-coordinated approach, but that's something that we have now that we didn't have 20 years ago, even 10 years ago to a large extent. So electronic health record capabilities, big data, perhaps as a subset of that, or one as, a, as the subset of the other, clinical networks as part of that monitoring and assessment potential tools, and then operations for response. And we'll have these lightning presentations shortly where we're talking about those four and providing some definitions to you. Third objective, help inform the development of strategic MCM monitoring and assessment plans. Turn the page. Hold that thought. Speak amongst yourselves. 
help inform the development of strategic MCM monitoring assessment plans for public health emergencies. So those are the three major objectives that we're dealing with here today. The meeting overview. So this will be interactive. We'll have keynote panels. Not so much sort of direct presentations. We'll have a few direct presentations thrown in here. But we'll have keynote panels, speaker sessions, with Q's and A's and facilitated discussion, many of which will be run by Laura as well as others. But you need to participate in that. We'll talk about the fact that these are all great people. We're all great people with incredible bios. We're not here to give the litany of who we are, right? You want to brag about who you are? Let's do it during our breaks. Uh, so speaker bios are available. They won't be read in full. They've been provided to the attendees in your packets. We ask that questions should be held until after the sessions during the Q's and A's and the facilitated discussion. So if you have questions, comments, please write them down, but allow this us to progress in terms of a panel discussion moving forward. During the facilitated discussions, you are encouraged to respond to questions from the facilitator and contribute remarks. So it's be part of the conversation. Point of view, life experience introduced here. A workshop proceedings, which is reasonably accurate and objective, it's a summary of what occurred at the workshop, will be authored by a repetur with the assistance of Academy staff. So a proceedings is going to come from this. The workshop proceedings may contain particular viewpoints attributed to individual participants or groups of participants in the workshop. As such, if you choose to provide verbal remarks, we ask you to please begin by stating your name, title, and affiliation. Of course, we're never going to check this, so if you're afraid, just change your name, your title, and your affiliation. <laughs> the workshop audio and video is being recorded, so it's all out there. Logistics. There's breakout conference rooms, lunch location, bathrooms, emergency exits are noted on a map that you can pick up at the registration table. So the way we're going to engage various formats to this. Lightning presentation. So the presentations we have, yes, there will be a few PowerPoints, are all like eight minutes long. We have timers out here, and it's boom, boom, boom. We'll have panel interviews and discussions. A reflection wall will be set up. And Laura, where's the reflection wall? Do you know? At the exit. At the exit. And again, expectations are full discussion and full participation from all of you. Right now, I'd like you to just get to know each other for like 30 seconds, turn to your neighbors, share your name, affiliation, what you hope to learn from and contribute to this workshop. Now's the getting together of people. If you know the person next to you, then find somebody and give them a hug. Okay, 10 second warning, 10. You know, you're gonna be a troublemaker, aren't you? Five second warning. Thank you, Wasn't, did that make you feel good? Okay, so hopefully, hey, I didn't get to meet you. Hi, Boris Lushnyak's my name. Hi, where are you from? Columbia University. Okay, thank you. Sue and I were on the same. It was interesting dealing with uh, sort of our, our workshop committee, if you will, because many of us are meeting perhaps for the first time face to face today. It was all done by telecoms and all that, which is a great way to do things efficiently, but very disconcerting because that sense of teams. We, for example, never had that photograph, the usual photograph of a, a National Academy workshop with all of us standing there, somebody holding a soccer ball. You know, um, the team picture was never quite taken. Okay, so now that we've done that, I'm just gonna sort of set the stage for our first speaker. Uh, what we're talking about is an all-hazards approach here. So if we're talking about med medical countermeasures, we're talking about the world of chem, bio, rad nuke, 
Um, so think of it as an all hazards approach. Obviously, for, with certain medical countermeasures, they're very specific for a given threat that exists out there. But in general, we're talking about everything that's available, right? When you talk about this all hazards approach, a lot of examples that we've had recently, for example, are the infectious disease approach. So without a doubt, that tends to be oftentimes the model that we use. Why? Because we, to some extent, have, have experienced things. And in particular, the way I look at infectious diseases, and I call them infectious disease disasters, is that they fall into three parameters. They fall into parameters of being man-made infectious disease disasters, i.e., the anthrax attacks, of which we've had personal experiences. You have the epidemic pandemic scenario, and the model here is influenza. In particular, many of us experienced the pandemic of 2009 as a response component to our career paths. And then you have the emerging, re-emerging grouping of diseases. And herein lies things that have intrigued us in these last few years. Ebola, emerging, re-emerging. The Zika scenario as emerging, re-emerging. And when we look at monitoring and assessment, in essence, it goes back to what I said initially, right? We have the stuff, let's call it, right? The medical countermeasures, they're out there, put into the hands of the population. But at some point, the question has always been asked. When I was back at the Food and Drug Administration, it was being asked for, for now generations, perhaps, is once the stuff's out there, especially since some of the stuff has limited information on its use, how do we monitor and assess how that stuff is being used, what the safety and efficacy profiles are in the midst of a public health emergency? That's our discussion here today. And in terms of this being a sense of urgency, I just have to remind you, right? Those of you who are in the field understand, we're constantly kind of under this, in this worrying stage, right? I used to have relatively unscathed hair before I joined the FDA years ago. I'm no longer with the FDA, but it grayed quickly. Right, I ran the Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats, and, and I remember back in the Park Lawn building days, this was early on, our neighbors would always say, Boris, they always let us know if something bad's going on. And I said, believe you me, if you see my whole team running down the hall screaming to the elevators, you know something bad. But not to make light of this, there is a sense of urgency. And that urgency exists around us, right? It's new diseases, right? The Ebola, the Zika. It's the pandemic potential, right? We're talking of another H blank, N blank that's constantly out there looming saying, is this the one? And of course, there's always that sense of the terrorist threat. This urgency really is important because it gives us the sense of another sort of subtitle to today's event, and that's connectivity. If we're talking about monitoring and assessment, how connected are we from the local level to the state level, from the state level to the national level, from the national level back circular to that local and state level? How is that conversation going about connectivity? And of course, the whole issue that comes up is you know, this need for connectivity, but it's all part of, and let's be honest, a national security strategy. Yeah, I remember a, a quote by President Obama in the midst of Ebola, right, as we were preparing, you know, the CDC response, the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps response, NGO response, DOD response. And, and the quote dealt with what? Basically saying this Ebola event that's taking place way out there in West Africa, it's a national security issue for the United States. And that's the reason what we're doing. So that's the framing of this. All of a sudden, we get a little bit more serious. Because although we can laugh about things and joke, and I always believe humor is an important part of our lives, you know, the subtitle of our office, and I know it's under the good leadership now of Rear Admiral Carmen Marr, and we said this in Latin, is we're here to put the fun back into counterterrorism. <laughs> so you have to have a good attitude. But at the end of the day, this is serious. And now, speaking of serious, our first speaker, 
that's a joke, uh, Red Admiral Carmen Marr. So without doing the whole thing of her CV, I actually uh, got to know Carmen back in 2005, six, five, when a young nurse officer, formerly in the armed services, coming from the NIH, was hired by one Boris Lushniak at the Food and Drug Administration. And I remember thinking to myself, OMG, that's oh my God for young people. <laughs> this is really going to be an incredible officer. And I'm proud to say that over the years, she has taken on leadership roles. I was at her swearing in as a one-star admiral, a rear admiral lower half. Yes, it's advancement when you go from captain and now you have the adjective rear and lower in your name. It's a good thing. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, uh, the acting Assistant Commissioner for Counterterrorism Policy, is that still the name of the office? And the Emerging Threat, in the Office of Counterterrorism, Emerging Threats, we're Admiral Carmen Marr.